Well, I'm not going to do the talk I was going to give. Oh, darn. I was going to give one on the Bardos. Remember, we were going to continue with the Bardos. But I got something else that's come up for me. Surrender, resistance, and... Non-resistance. Surrender, non-resistance, and... Acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance, surrender, and non-resistance. <laughs> Acceptance, surrender, and non-resistance. To me, it become the vocal point of my life again. It, it began this morning with, well, what device am I going to bring with me to be with me? Because I can't take my little red truck out because it doesn't like getting all wet in the way. So it's like, well, then we're going to bring this, and then we're going to bring the walker, and then we're going to bring the wheelchair as well. I said, but I don't want to do all three. But then you stand too long. And then I found myself getting into this whole tirade, tirage, about being in resistance to, well, what am I going to bring? And right away I got, well, I guess I'm going to teach what I most need to learn. Resistance to what is. Yes? What is, is that what difference does it make whether I use this or this or a wheelchair? Does it really matter or don't use any of it? All the things that we're in resistance to persist. And every time we have some sort of mindset that says it needs to be this way or I can't deal with it, well, guess what? Then we don't deal with it. And the morning that we could have had, the people we could have looked at, the conversations we could have been engaged in, we're not because we're in resistance and we're not accepting and we're not surrendering to what is. So I figured this is the talk I need to give this morning. Do you mind? No. I have lots of people who are saying to me that maybe you should go see John of God. I get lots of suggestions. I'm telling you when you're in this new age spiritual plethora of things that can be done for your healing, you get more stuff than you ever know what to deal with. So John of God, people go to John of God, they come back, things, things happen to you when you go see John of God. Maybe you should go see John of God. Some people get healed by John of God, some take time, some die. Well, what are you going to do? That's the way it is here. But go see John of God. But then I thought, you know what, I don't need to go see John of God, I need to go see Jim Downer of God. Jim Downer of God? Jim Downer of God, who read this on Wednesday at our healing session. It became, for me, the impetus for my talk today. And I want to share it with you. You ready for it? It comes right out of the Daily Word. And I didn't have to travel thousands of miles to get there. It showed up right there at 12 o'clock, right in front of my face. And it's from the Daily Word. It says, on non-resistance. I do not resist change, for I know only God the good governs me. I do not resist change, because I know that only God the good governs me. I don't resist change, however challenging it may be. When I'm called upon to meet it, I know this truth. As a door to a former way of life closes, another door opens. I know that only good governs me. My circumstances and my environment, for God governs me. I do not resist change. I maintain my poise. I don't give way to fearful thoughts, except this morning. I do not persist in feeling that I cannot be happy in other circumstances, in other places. I find that change is easy to make when I remember that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit that is wonderfully flexible and adaptable. Don't you love that? God has given me a spirit that welcomes new ideas, new ways of living, new places, new friends. God has given me a spirit that is willing to grow, a spirit that is willing to unfold and to change. I got that from Jim of God, not too bad, from Richard of God, from Brad of God. Everybody is of God. Where else and who would you be of if it weren't of God? So your, your, your answer to your question lies in the moment of surrender, of acceptance, of being present to this moment of non-resistance. It's right here in this moment that wherever you are, God is in this moment, powerfully so. I've had people who've um, taken a while, some of them have taken a while, to get back to me since I've gotten my, my diagnosis, particularly some very close friends. And one of the particular ones that I want to share with you today was actually someone who just gotten back to me recently. And this actually comes 
from my newsletter to all of you that you'll be getting for the July or August 2014 newsletter. And I went on to say this. As the subtlety of my current condition becomes less and less subtle and more obvious, I am realizing that I have no place to run away from these kinds of teachings. That is, the teachings of non-resistance, surrender, and acceptance. <laughs> Let's just face it, there's enough on our plate now to be able to fill our, our whole meal with these thoughts. I have a friend who I've known now for years who has just not been able to get in touch with me for the first time yet until now. He said this, it's taken me this long to sort out all the ways I was feeling about the news of your cancer. He said, I've always relished your physicality. It's been such a large part of the identity I've placed upon you. And it's helped me celebrate physicality within my own way, within myself. The news reminded me of how persistent I am in holding on to a worldly window through which I view the special people in my life, which is, of course, a reflection of my personal tendency to see life as a physical thing, right? We all look around and we see life as a physical thing. We can talk about non-physical all day long, but you run around and you see people and it looks like it's a physical thing. For me, it's been three months since I've gotten diagnosis of this cancer in April. The physical thing called cancer is no longer just a word, a thought, or a deed I get to tiptoe around or run away from. It defines the physical aspect of what I'm experiencing, but it does not define who I am. Amen. It doesn't define who I am. It's the physical aspect of what I'm going through. It's what is now. It is what is. And I accept the fact of its appearance in my life at this moment in time. At this moment in time. Lately, I... <laughs> this might be too weird, but... Lately, I've gotten to taking, um, looking at myself naked in the mirror. All right. Now, I've done this before for 45 years. Particularly as a buff man working out, we're constantly always looking in the mirror. Hey, take a look at this. Look at that. But now, when I look at this and I look at that, it's changing. It's changing right before my eyes. The image that I've held of myself for 64 years, in particular the last 45, is no longer what it was before. So I've taken to just looking in the mirror and with my crutches at both sides and just looking at myself, this thing is changing before my eyes. And by the way, do you notice yours is changing too? <laughs> Ask the people around me, they know who you are. And what, what, what I'm getting is, when I look at that mirror image, I, I, my mantra is, I am not a body, I am free. For I am still as God created me. Of course, of miracles. I am not a body, I am free. For I am still as God created me. When I begin to infuse that image and likeness to the cells and atoms of my being, everything changes. And all of a sudden, what wasn't there before doesn't matter as much. What's present now becomes all important. Yes? I am not a body, I am free. I'm an ageless, timeless soul living in a body for a few short moments. And none of us know how long that will be for. So I'm playing with that. I'm, I'm, I'm playing in the fields of what does that feel like? to let go of my resistance, to let go and surrender. What does it feel like to really feel that I can accept myself, not as I was, but as I am now? That's a very powerful, powerful teaching. So, so people have asked Abraham, I've been looking at the Abraham material, well, why do some people go and they have these miraculous John of God, if, if that's the example, healings? Some people don't have it at all, and some people die. What, what is the thing there? Well, she says, it's the intensity of the desire that often lies behind the surface of what you think you want. Because all, a lot of the time, we don't know what we want. We not, we're not sure whether we want to stay or we want to go. That's a sole choice that I don't know if I'm able to make here with my conscious mind. It's a choice to maybe be done with the physical. It's a choice maybe to go further. It's a choice maybe to live to be the oldest person on the planet. I don't know what it looks like. But I do know, I can only know for myself, and just barely. 
I cannot know for other people what it should be for them, what it could be for them. I can only know what's true for myself. And when I surrender my resistance to what is, this tremendous energy comes towards me that allows me to be present for the possibility of all that could be as well. And that's a powerful place to be. That's something I can bring into everyday life. I look at non-resistance. Where am I resisting? I look at where I'm not surrendering. I look at where I'm not surrendering. I just take a look at all the different places in me where I still hold on to how it could have been, should have been, and would have been. You know, coulda, shoulda, and woody? The three pets that will drive you insane, that will nibble you to death until you die. Goody, Woody, and Shoody, you know about them? They hang out everywhere nibbling at us. Whenever we're present for what is, what we can be is revealed to us through us. Very, 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 very powerful teaching. And that comes from John of God. That comes from Jesus of Nazareth. That comes from Buddha, who was to Siddhartha. I get a sense that how it works here, it's not like how we think it is. How we think it is, is that, okay, um, I have a deficiency. My deficiency is cancer. I want to get rid of cancer. So I'm going to use spiritual principle to get rid of cancer. I'm focusing on the deficiency called cancer. Now I'll get rid of it. What it does is it focuses energy on deficiency. It gives you more of what you don't have rather than what you'd like. Yeah. I have a problem with prosperity. I need more money. If I just had more money, then I would be happy, right? So I'm missing money. I have a deficiency in money. So that focuses our focus on not enough money. So we end up getting not enough money. Okay. We have a problem with our relationship life. Somebody's a real pain in my, and I, what if, I gotta get somebody different in my life. I have a deficiency in my relationship life. So what do we do? We create more deficiency in our relationship life. That's not where our focus needs to be. That just takes us off of the possibility, onto what we've already got not enough of and don't want more of. <laughs> so when we take our deficiency and go, I don't know what this is for. It's in my life, but I'm willing to move with it. Something shifts in our consciousness, and we begin to create for ourselves something that maybe wasn't even in the scope of what we thought could happen but was ready to happen, because now we're not focusing on making it so in order for us to be happy. Ah! And sometimes, I don't know what that is. I think, my opinion, of course, you get your fault, but you get your own. I think that when someone would come up to Jesus of God, or Buddha, or Siddhartha, or Jim Downer of, of the Healing Circle, and, and they ask him, ask him a question, they don't look at them and go, well, um, I see your deficiency, let me help you get rid of it. Take two of these. I don't think they do that. I think what they do for us is just don't see the deficiency and only see the allowing. How much allowing do you have in your life to allow this to happen? And if the allowing is there, which comes through non-resistance and comes through surrender, which comes through letting go, which comes through being present, then whatever you need to have happen can happen through you, and it doesn't meet with any resistance to the miracle unfolding through you. It's really quite easy to say, but sometimes difficult to practice because we want to hold on to how it's supposed to look. And we don't know, we just said that a moment ago, we don't know about the mystery, do we, of what it's supposed to be, because we are spiritual beings, not, not physical beings. We're only having a moment in time in a body. And the difficult part isn't with our death, it's with our life. <laughs> That's the hard part. So Esther Hicks, as the channel for this one called Abraham, had a direct example of this with Jerry Hicks. You, you all know about three years ago, Jerry got cancer. The, the partner that she was hanging out with got cancer. And, and Esther Hicks, the personality, had a very good idea of what his healing looked like. You know, you've got an idea of what you think somebody else's healing looks like, don't you? Sure. Oh, I know you do. <laughs> I want it to look this way and this way and this way. And when it does, healings happen. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. So her idea was, Jerry's going to lift up his vibrational frequency, and he's going to heal himself of cancer. And Abraham, this great oversoul, these beings that are speaking through this woman, will be part of that. But you know what? That was what she wanted for Jerry. 
That isn't what Jerry wanted for himself. Jerry wanted to be done with his physical life. How does that fit in when you're like sort of this new age avatar? A much better miracle would be you hang out with Abraham, you get healed of cancer, and everything looks really great, and it writes another great book. <laughs> Not, no, you know what, Esther? I love you. We've got a great relationship. I'm done with my body. No, no, you're not. And, and she said, it put Esther, the personality, Esther, the personality, it put her on notice that it wasn't what she thought it was, that she needed to be able to let it go, that, that she was resisting what was true for him. Do you see a place in your life where you might be doing the same thing? Where you're resisting something, where you're holding on to what you think it's supposed to look like, rather than allowing it to be what it is. And so she had to give up her assumption that what healing looked like for her was the same healing that it should look like for Jerry. You can't do that for anybody but for yourself. So sometimes we're not even in touch with, well, what is my deepest call right now? What is it that my soul really wants to have happen in this moment? It, it could be a physical result of symptoms changing. It might not be. It might be something very different. Either way, in any way, you, 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 the real you. I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. That you cannot be harmed and will not be touched with whatever decision that you make. Isn't it good to know that? So you can go on with just focusing on where is the resistance to change? Where is the glorious thing that I can know in spite of myself, regardless of what change I'm going through? Where is the thing that can move me to my next greatness without me thinking it's got to be a certain way, otherwise I have failed? No, you can't fail. You cannot go wrong. You can only do what's yours to do. In a place of surrender, non-resistance, and acceptance. That's how you do it. That's how you work with you. And that physical thing that you do brings it to you, through you, and you hardly have to work at it at all. Because the moment you start struggling to work with a deficiency because something's lacking, you bring the very thing you're holding on to into existence. <laughs> That's the way it works. Sorry, it's just the way it works. So we're in ministerial school. It's 19... 80, we have a diagnosis for our child who's a year old, you've heard the story, called globoid cell leukodystrophy. You know the very long name to the disease that you could possibly get that says no help medical model. There's nothing anybody can do for this particular disease. There's 200 cases of it in the world in 1980 and only none have been healed of it. And nobody's made it past five years old. That's, that's, that's what you've been given. So we're given that diagnosis. It's a big one. And while we're in ministerial school, this is 1980 now. Do you remember the days when we used to type on typewriters? Do you remember the days when we used to use whiteout? Yes. Everything I did was whiteout. My fingers were filled with whiteout because I'm dyslexic. So you remember those days when, when, when someone would give you information about healing techniques? And by the way, everybody in the world in Unity Village had healing techniques of which they healed themselves of. So they were all coming to our house and they were delivering things in mailboxes. They were throwing, remember the old days when they used to take a mail bag and throw it over the top and say, this is your mail, like we get now every day in, in a little box, now we get it in big bags. Back then, we had stuff piled to the ceiling of all the different healing modalities that we were to be involved with. And, and many of them looked very promising. And because we had no other place to go, we just went for the non-traditional model. So we tried everything, every technique you could possibly think of, until we almost, well, took her out of her physical body with one of our healing techniques. And it wasn't until a man named Baba Hari Das of God came into our life. <laughs> he walked in at a moment when we needed to hear a teaching that we were ready to heal and heal and be healed by. He came and he said, when he met us, he met Kristen. And he was this guy with this long, flowing, sort of dreadlocky hair with a big turban on. And he was one of the many gurus who didn't end up with egg on his beard, 
like many of them did during the 80s. Things happen. You get to America, man, and it sucks you in. Because it's fun here to be spiritual and have a whole lot of followers. You know that one. And so he didn't get caught up in that. And he was totally focused in on Kristen. And he said to us when he saw her little then four-year-old body, he said, in India, we believe that children like this come into the world with a very special short focus. They're only supposed to be here for a little bit of time to teach the great, the great lesson of acceptance, surrender, and non-resistance. And that's why they're here. And they don't stay, nor do they need to stay for a long time to give everybody a great lesson of that. So she will be here for a short period of time. We believe she's a saint. She's come for that reason. And she's going to bless so many people with her presence, way more than she could have if she lived to be 80. You have been blessed with a saint in your presence. And she only made it a few more years. But she did more to bring those three qualities to life, and for hundreds of people, than she might have if she'd lived here for a really long time. So we had to really look at, Maureen and I both had to look at, and take a feel of this inventory of who is, who is healing whom here? And what does healing really look like? Do I really even know? And so I look at my, my notes from those times. From the book that someday will probably get written. And it's called, this chapter, the little bit I'm going to read to you, Acceptance, Surrender, and Non-Resistance. And it's something that Maureen and I came to at the same time. We decided, Maureen and I, to take a look at who was healing whom. Maureen and I simultaneously realized that maybe healing didn't look like our version of it. Maybe we had no idea what real healing was for Kristen or for anybody else, for that matter. Jerry Hicks or whoever it was. Maybe it was our perception that needed healing, not hers. When we moved into a space of acceptance around Kristen's situation, the acceptance was like a giant elixir that relaxed us into a new relationship with her condition. Fighting to obtain what isn't, rather than just being present for what is, is an exhausting way to live your life. It feels like a giant weight had been lifted from our backs. We no longer had to fix Kristen, for she wasn't broken. Only our image of ourselves needed correction. This kind of acceptance became a healing in and of itself. Whatever physical change that might happen from then on, beside the point. Our minds had been healed of the disease of wanting a desired outcome. Our life could then return to being a precious moment by moment unfoldness of enoughness. Just as it was then, just as it is now, we could feel the giant soul force of Kristen Marie <laughs> lifting from the weight of our burden of trying to fix her and make her into our image and likeness rather than letting her be made in God's image and likeness. And I'm telling you, when you ease up on the burden of that one, you become a nicer person to be around, not just for yourself, but for others as well. So, let's go to our lesson summation. Surrendering to the path of least resistance means letting go of any justification of where you think you are along the path. Two, this kind of acceptance becomes a healing in and of itself. Whatever change happens then on, is beside the point. Fighting to obtain what isn't, rather than just being with what is, is an exhausting way to live your life. When you let go of that, a giant weight is taken up off your back. Don't you feel it? And finally, from Jim of God, I do not resist change, however challenging it may be. When I'm called upon to meet it, I know this truth. As the door to a former way of life closes, another door opens. I know that only God governs me, my circumstances, and my environment. For God governs me, and I do not need to resist change. I maintain my poise. I do not give way to fearful thoughts. <laughs> because I am not a body. 
I am free, for I am still as God created me, a changeless essence made in God's image and likeness. Practice this, my friends, not just for yourself this week, but for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Namaste. Namaste.